Afternoon, everyone. Um, I like to teach people to juggle, um, not because I'm particularly good at it or anything, but it's a surprisingly insightful task for a few reasons. On the one hand, it tells you something about someone. It tells you something about how they embrace this rather chaotic activity, how they deal with challenge, frustration, setbacks, that sort of thing. On the other hand, it has a handy hidden little metaphor in it as well. People often get stuck at a particular point when they first start to learn to juggle. We'll call it the, the point of three catches. So it's where they've begun by throwing one ball to, the, to one side and the other and vice versa, with two balls in play. And they then introduce the third ball. And it's at this stage where all of their focus and attention goes into just making three catches. And they struggle to get any further because juggling is cyclical. It requires that you keep letting go. In essence, you actually have to risk dropping in order to juggle. Now, on the one hand, you might say, okay, that's not very significant, you know, for something so innocuous as learning to juggle. But what about people's greater ambitions, their greater goals? If you apply the same mentality there, what does that mean? What does that make them? And third, Sometimes people don't even engage with the task at all. They fear a potential truth coming their way in that they might invest themselves in, in this activity and yet even though they invest and put plenty of effort in, they might not get there, they may still fail. And for some people, it's too much for them to overcome. They struggle with the idea of what that means to invest themselves in something and come up short and as a result they don't. For reference, and as the introduction said, I'm a consultant for uh, various businesses, professional athletes and sports teams, and a particular focus or a significant chunk of what I do is about helping people to overcome uh, issues, but in particular to unlock their potential. That might sound a little strange given that they're successful business people or professional athletes, and yet even among them, their full potential often knowingly eludes them. Now, my approach to both consultancy and writing is to try to find the commonalities between philosophy and psychology and use that little intersection to try to target people, or impact people at a bit of a deeper level. Sometimes with cheap little gimmicks like juggling, sometimes not. And I've read just about every piece of philosophy I can get my hands on. I've read thousands of psychological journal, journal articles and I think I've whittled down human potential to really focusing on three things. And that's our attitude and our mindset towards challenge, risk, and truth, just like I did with juggling earlier. So the first one, challenge, is pretty significant. It's a large one because it's multifaceted, because it's not just about how we perceive challenge in the first place. It's also about how we tackle it, how we continue to seek them out. Some people might be familiar with the likes of Jordan Peterson, who regularly uses the Taoist philosophy of yin and yang, of chaos and order, to describe the, the balance of opposing forces in the world, where chaos represents anything new, anything dangerous, anything difficult, anything that exists outside of our comfort zone. Yeah, interestingly, growth and development only occurs in the unknown, in the chaos, or else we'd already be able to do it, we'd already know it. And interestingly, that word chaos is quite significant as well, in that how we approach, how we deem, how we perceive chaos has direct ramifications on us physiologically and psychologically. So for example, if you deem a particular task to be a threat, you have negative repercussions, negative ramifications. But if you, deal, if you uh, deem that task to be a challenge, you're invigorated, motivated, stimulated by it. We see similarities, we look at the work of Abraham Maslow, the father of self-actualization, who said that healthy subjects are generally unthreatened and unfrightened by the unknown. They accept it, they're often even more attracted by it than the known. We then follow this little psychological rabbit hole down to the work of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, a Hungarian uh, psychologist, 
who talks about flow, uh, optimum states, flow states, where you can break up larger tasks into uh, smaller ones where you select just the right level of difficulty and challenge with which to do battle so that you remain invigorated as opposed to it being too much where it's a threat and that's fear inducing or when it's too easy and it's boring, it's mundane. Finally, we see the same sentiment in the, in the work of Anders Ericsson, the pioneer of a technique called deliberate practice. Now, deliberate practice, just for reference, is a structured and purposeful approach to practice in which an individual selects just the right level of challenge that exists just outside of their comfort zone, obtains direct and precise feedback, and then systematically works on imperfections in order to improve. And to date, it's the most successful and efficient way of learning to uh, better your skills at virtually anything you can think of. Let's see the, the commonalities here. Notice the, the connections. Okay, we have to see chaos as challenge rather than threat. We have to select just the right level of task, difficulty and challenge with which to do battle and then systematically work on imperfections in order to improve. So that's our first element. Our second was risk. So risks, as far as they pertain to human beings, can be categorised normally into uh, physical, emotional or financial perceived losses. Now, our attitude to risk is largely determined by personality. So, um, and neurotransmitters and hormones and various other things. And yet, given that they are perceived, they are subjective, they're malleable, we can do something about them. Interestingly, uh, Bronnie Ware, uh, an Australian author, wrote a book entitled The Five Most Common Regrets of the Dying and found that probably the largest one was people wish that they had taken more risks, that they had a different approach to risks during their life. Now, it's not that these people have suddenly undergone in their final hours some kind of uh, personality transplant, but instead, now that they know what was to become of them, based upon the decisions that they did or didn't make, the risks they did or didn't take, they now see just how potentially negative their approach to risk was in the first place. Interestingly, I think the third most common regret was of not being brave enough to express your feelings honestly. Again, the risk associated with, or the potential uh, embarrassment associated with that was seen as too great. What I'm suggesting, or what I'm advocating here, is a movement away from the normal questions that we would ask ourselves. Things like, uh, what do I stand to lose if this goes wrong? And move more in a direction towards, what future do I negate by definition by not taking this chance or this risk? In that sense, we get to work our way back from our biggest dreams, our largest ambitions, and then select risks that facilitate those dreams. That's, a, that's an important point to note, selecting risks that facilitate dreams rather than convincing ourselves to stay in this sort of more mundane practicality. Um, I'm suggesting here that we change our perspective towards a threshold of risk and reward. It's like it was so eloquently put by Elizabeth Appel. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. What I'm trying to suggest here is to put more emphasis on the futures that you negate by not taking those chances, rather than the almost petty, silly, potential embarrassments that you might or, or may not experience along the way. Which ones should have more weight? But for most people, that's a very difficult task. As Oscar Wilde wrote a few years back, nowadays people die of a sort of creeping common sense and discover when it is too late that the only thing one's, one ever regrets are one's mistakes. Uh, a very surprisingly wise Jim Carrey said, so many of us choose our path out of fear disguised as practicality. What we really want seems impossibly out of reach, so we never dare to ask the universe for it. And finally, Shakespeare, cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. So we're seeing these deathbed revelations again, aren't we? The realisation of just how many times you died, metaphorically of course, by not taking those chances, by not taking those risks. 
So perhaps you need to change again some of the questions that you ask yourself. Maybe ask yourself a question like, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And then whatever you come up with, just go and do that. At least you'll have less things to regret on your deathbed. But at the same time, you get to enjoy some of the more positive psychological states that come from being more of an active driver of your life. So from self-determination to self-actualization, a key element of that is autonomy and exercising that autonomy towards things that you are motivated by and driven by. So that was our second one, risk. And then the final one is truth. And what I mean here is, is to become a lover of truth. If you want to unlock your potential, you've got to become a lover of truth, your truths, and the most difficult ones. So I'm talking about the tough questions that would really give you the most amount of value. Uh, Carl Jung, to paraphrase him, that which we need most is found where we least want to look. So again, I'm going to get you to ask, lots of questions, ask yourself lots of questions. Where would you not want to look? What is it about yourself that you would rather ignore? Now, of course, these aren't easy questions. They're tough by nature. But we're talking about maximising, unlocking potential here. It's not supposed to be easy. No one ever got to where they really wanted to get to by being comfortable the entire way. Instead, we would then determine the strength of someone's character, of their spirit, as Friedrich Nietzsche wrote here, by the amount of truth they could tolerate, and more precisely, to what extent needs to have it, or they need to have it diluted, disguised, sweetened, muted, falsified. If you're thinking about getting to your full potential, if that's about pushing to the edges of your ability, you've got to find out where the edges are. And that, for me, or those, would be your truths. So I'm going to ask you to just indulge me for a moment. I want you to imagine, or you can see this one here, a door at the end of a corridor. And on the other side of that door is the answer to all of the important questions that concern your life and your potential. Is my partner right for me? Um, she's here, so I shouldn't have said that, really. Um, <laughs> uh, do I have what it takes to become a professional footballer uh, or to be successful in this business or that business, whatever venture it is? How willing would you be to open that door and hear those answers regardless of the outcome? And given the, the gravity of the situation, perhaps the door is a little more like this, you know, something less inviting. And yet, it's those truths, it's those answers that would orient you towards a better future. If the, if the answer's favourable, then congratulations, you've had some confirmation that you're along the right path. If it's not favourable, you're empowered with this new information that enables you to ask new questions, to come up with different dreams, new goals, ambitions. But either way, you're empowered, you're armed with this information, as opposed to allowing uh, a deluded sense you know, to permeate your consciousness all the time. But for me, that's not exactly where the value completely lies or ends. For me, the journey to getting to those answers is the even more crucial part. So what I mean by that is, Someone that genuinely wants to know the answers to those deep questions, the ones that really concern them, that will bring them the most amount of value, will go through hell and high water in order to get those answers. They'll face the necessary challenges. They'll take the necessary risks. They'll subject themselves to the judgment of others. They'll relish competition, even if they don't win. Just imagine what someone with that mindset is likely to achieve in the process. So in that sense, as Lessing once wrote, the worth of man lies not in the truth which he possesses, or believes that he possesses, but in the honest endeavour which he puts forth to secure that truth. Or as Einstein famously paraphrased, the search for truth is more precious than its possession. So, I appreciate, and I, I, I kind of need to apologise to some degree, I haven't given you any uh, easy life hacks or whatever terms it is that people use now, you know, some cheap tricks in order to maximise your potential. 
because I honestly don't believe that it's that easy. It's supposed to be difficult by definition. You know, I'm asking you to do some difficult things. I'm saying you need to uh, embrace chaos and see it as challenge rather than threat. That you need to break those challenges up into smaller bite-sized chunks and select just the right level of difficulty so as to be out of your comfort zone and stimulated. I'm suggesting that you take risks that facilitate dreams and change your approach towards your threshold of risk and reward uh, where you, rather than convince yourself to remain tight in the bud, you're brave enough to risk dropping the balls in order to succeed. I'm recommending that you become a lover of truth to really, really difficult questions, those that would give you the greatest amount of value. Now, I appreciate that not everyone wants to learn to juggle, and that's absolutely fine. There's more to life than juggling. Um, but like many things in life, there's a little more to juggling than merely juggling as well. For me, it doesn't matter what you pursue, whatever it is that you desire, whatever it is that you're working towards. What matters is that you do it with a sense of purpose and vigor that leaves no regrets. And I think if you address the things that, that I've mentioned today, and I mean really address them properly, you'll be very pleasantly surprised with what you find. Because I think you'll realize just how far your potential really goes.